um, conservatives in the future is going to need people who really don't mind me hating. <laughs> Welcome back to Uncommon Decency. Here's a question. How come conservatives are so marginalized in mainstream culture, even as they keep winning elections on both sides of the pond? Brexit, Trump, Boris, it's not as if a right has undergone extinction yet. It's just that its arsenal is aimed at elections alone. Meanwhile, the culture keeps shifting to the left. Small men on the wrong side of history. That's Ed West's diagnosis of this paradox, informed by his growing up as a Tory boy in cosmopolitan London. It's a thoroughly enjoyable book, laced with British wit, hilarious anecdotes, and incisive commentary. Let's get to our interview with him. Wonderful. Well, um, welcome to the second episode here of Uncommon Decency. We are privileged to be joined today by Ed West. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure. You know, Ed is a wonderful writer. He's the deputy editor at Unheard, the British opinion side, which is becoming a huge hit on the web. And, you know, a lot of people across Europe and America are getting to, to read Ed's writing through it. Importantly, Ed is, is also most recently the author of a fascinating book that was published by Constable, I believe, sometime towards the end of last year, Ed. The title of it is Small Men on the Wrong Side of History, The Fall and Unlikely Return of Conservatism. And uh, much. Previous- it came out... Um- well, it's all about pes- my pessimism, but the book came out in March, the third week of March, exactly as Britain went into lockdown. <laughs> and, uh, and, all the, oh, and all the bookshops shut. So, I mean, my pessimism was completely justified. Uh, as always, and, and, and from an intellectual standpoint, your pessimism was also justified because you wrote a book about how conservatives are losing everything and write it three weeks after, oh, three months after Boris Johnson was elected. So the timing could have been, uh, could have been better. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was absolutely, yeah, that was that was bad. I mean, damn it, Jeremy Corbyn really did badly. <laughs> I mean, there's, the, U, the US edition is coming out in, I think, April. So, I mean, obviously, a, a massive Trump defeat would be good for me personally. I don't know if it's uh, the world or not, but if he gets completely slaughtered in it, and it looks like... Republicans have finished, that'd be great to me. Well, thanks so much for, for clarifying. By the way, my apologies. I, I believe Amazon may have picked up the US publication date, but it's, it's yeah, useful no, no, to know. Okay. Kind of- I just didn't mention it. It was... Um, uh, it was I suppose it was supposed to originally, it got delayed a little bit, my own fault. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the time of the election was unfortunate, obviously the time of the pandemic. But then I think maybe since in the subsequent months, I, I feel that they slightly I mean, justified the thesis, especially, in, you know, in June when the whole kind of madness started, the, the BLM thing, which to me felt like this is really, this is conservatism and starting mm. the kind of country I believe in really sort of, being defeated this felt like the sort of end of the, the culture wars you know we're, we're like a defeated army i felt actually my my testosterone levels must have dropped or something during that period it was, it was uh, yeah it's like we're really losing here um yeah everyone likes to think they're always right aren't they even if it's to tell everyone that well right yeah that's a that's a really useful way to get right right into the heart of the thesis of, of the book, which we really encourage everyone to to head over to Amazon and, and grab a copy. It's really going to be worth your time, and it's a really good way to start. You obviously wrote this book before the kind of great woke revolution that that we're that is still ongoing, um, very much in the UK, almost as much uh, if not as much as as in, in the United States. But I'll, I'll just get started here by asking you to briefly, you know, one of the things that you are uh, that you are uh, prime uh, readers with is the idea that you know conservatives have been winning political b- battles over and over again. Boris Johnson obviously recently uh, won re-election. And, and, but in the culture, the story is totally different. We've been losing uh, uh, repeatedly and, and very badly. Um, so can you briefly kind of delve deeper into that? And what are, what are the main, what, what's kind of the core argument that drove you to write this book? I suppose my, my, I mean, the original genesis of the book was I suppose, like a personal uh, catharsis, trying to make me understand why i um, I still I felt conservative, and everyone around my my age group and my social network, people you know, I was born in 1978, went to university, middle class, like no one was becoming more conservative as they got older. I realized, mm. and, uh, you know, even when I got in my early 30s, I think when I started writing this, the original notes, this, uh, I thought, you know, my friends actually they're kind of becoming more liberal in most ways because the culture is moving so much more to the the left on on like, social issues that they're not becoming conservative and. 
even ones when they start getting married to a certain extent, mm. that's even that's not happening. Although I come to that, that marriage is a huge part of it. Marriage and child raising is is a big factor why the culture in general is more liberal, just because there are more single people and liberalism and being single are sort of so linked. Um, so I kind of looked into and I, I just looked into more of the data and it said in the in the US and in the group Britain, just people born from the nineteen seventies and towards the late nineteen seventies weren't really progressive mm. or conservative as previous generations had. There has been a cultural change. And I thought the most obvious reason, apart from either the fertility rates falling, was uh decline in religion. And that one religion became much more um sort of minority <laughs> thing. Um then people's kind of moral lodestar becomes politics instead and, and you know if you meet someone in Britain and they're not religious and they're you know conscientious and and, you know, really concerned about the world and want to make the world a better place, they tend to be on the centre-left because mm. that's just the, the natural gravity point because, you know, in the past they would have sort of been involved in the church and the church tends towards slightly more conservative in many ways. Mm. Now, I thought this is like even even in America, this stuff, you know, we think of secularisation, Britain and France, probably most secular countries in the world in many ways, um, and they've always been ahead and the States is quite far behind and other European countries somewhere in between. But even in the States, this is happening. The younger generation are really, really leaving Christianity in droves. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, the same people who don't feel a huge attached to religion, they feel hugely attached to politics. You look at their, their studies, say politics means everything to them. It means so much to their world. And this seems to become mm. more of an issue when they have less of like a hinterland, less of an interest in other things in life. Uh, you know, less like a real support network at home and, and a sort of a diverse support network than meet other people. Uh, and I think this is a lot of, causing a lot of trouble on a lot of people. You see, social media, a lot of people are are generally uh, making themselves almost not well oh, yeah. in politics. They're driving themselves kind of mad. I mean, I have to say, the, the inspiration for the book at first, so it was after reading Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, I thought that was such a great book. Um, and that made me think, wow, actually, you know, it made me feel much better about it. I, mean, I didn't get angry listening to the radio anymore, just thinking, what are these Egypts on about? Uh, you know, I understand what your point of view is. I understand why you think it's much better, and I hope that they would understand me. Um, and it just, you know, there are reasons why we all different beliefs. So that was the kind of genesis. I wanted to, you know, understand my own why I'm conservative. Was it my upbringing? Was it sort of, maybe was it genetics? Just why why can't I join in these feel good, you know, beliefs that all my contemporaries have? Like if we just if we're all fairer, nicer, we can make the world a better place. You know, we can solve all these age old problems to do with the human condition. Um, you know, I don't think the bad guy thinks the humans are naturally, are naturally kind, unkind, or selfish because it just feels bad. But I mean, the book really came into gear after the the twenty seventeen election, which was sort of like a draw, um, and in which in which like the Conservatives got the biggest uh, number of seats, and they were up against a very very left wing Labour party. But it was just noticeable amongst professionals, the Conservatives were absolutely being hammered. Um, they were just being amongst the middle class. They were emptying um, of conservatives. Uh, it was becoming so repulsive. You know, things like the medical profession, which used to be quite conservative. Um, I mean, lawyers have always tended towards the left because mm, uh, for various them. reasons. You know, law, I suppose lawyers are sort of defending the the weak, as they would say, or you know, defending criminals. Other people say, it. but doctors tend to be quite conservative now. Doctors are very left wing overall, and in all the major institutions. I mean, academia is an extreme example of this, where. Academia has gone from being about two to one uh, left to right, and that was the case in Britain as well as in... I mean, Britain was actually more balanced. If you go back to the 60s, uh, about you know a third of academics voted conservative. You'd never find that now. I mean, now it's about 9%, and, and I imagine those 9% are pretty old on average. Amongst the younger generation, it's going to be 1% or 2%. Um, so those are extreme examples. But most other institutions, you know, science, conservatives are just dropping out of existence. Um and it's becoming a sort of proletarianized movement. Uh, I mean, the, one of the analogies I draw, you know, with the Reformation is I see it in, um, you know, the Reformation when the Catholics ended up at the very, you know, after, by the Civil War they're about ten percent. But until until quite late into the Reformation in England, Catholics had a definite um, strong support. I mean, you know, the English people were not; they were basically moved into Reformation. Uh, Kind of begrudgingly. I mean, I imagine if you had, for example, you know, Elizabeth, the time of Elizabeth during the during the Great Armada, if you had a refer- referendum on religion at the time, I, I think the Catholics probably would have won. 
even though they were sort of losing, they're on the wrong side of history, they still had numbers. And then that was the Brexit, um, a similar thing. You know, Brexit just about won, but if it was five or ten years later, Remain would have easily won just because, you know, demographics are on their side. So, you know, Catholicism was basically a few and basically a rural kind of peasantry who still stuck with the old faith until finally, eventually, the sort of sheer power of the London-based sort of Protestant um, mm. side just sort of, you know, overwhelmed them in numbers and, you know, using public shaming and uh, making people believe that their views are so, you know, outside of the norm of, you know, almost unpatriotic, which is how sort of conservative views are, are sort of presented in Britain. You know, we, it's a, it's, again, the new Labour leader today I mean, he's pretty good. So I think he may well win the next election. He was talking about British values. And British values are basically just liberal values. I mean, the whole point of British values is it was set up to, uh, you know, kind of indo not indoctrinate, so teach the children of immigrants about, um, you know, to sort of turn away from radical Islam. But, I mean, so many of the people caught up in it are basically conservatives because what it teaches is a progressive uh, worldview in which they equate with Britain. And, I mean, that's, that's the Reformation all again, you know, if you're... If you just don't believe in this set of values, not really one of us, which is, um, you know, it's strange. You're replacing one kind of tribalism with another, which is political tribalism. But, Ed, why do you think that um, conservatives have been so trounced in uh, academia, in journalism? Do you think it's a disinterest, disinterest from their part? Or do you think there's a snowball effect after such a threshold of, of liberals, you only hire more liberals? How, how do you explain that conservatives have... Um, being so utterly wiped out of the intellectual sphere? Uh, so, yeah, it's a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, I, one of them is sort of conquests law, I think it's normally... Uh, maybe this is also the oh, Sullivan's law, I get confused now. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, once an institution, if an institution isn't mm. um, explicitly concerned, yeah, it will become left-wing just because... Even if it's, you know, like a small, tiny, tiny shift bit by bit, because if, you, you know, certain views make you appear more kind and compassionate and more gentle and, you know, mm. liberal views mm. are all high status views. They're the kind of things, that's what people put their dating sites. It makes you sound generous, it makes you sound cosmopolitan, it makes you sound wealthy, you know, you're not worried about crime because you live in a nice area, because you're brave, you're open-minded towards people from different countries because you've travelled all about the place and um, yeah. these are all very sort of high status and... Uh, Generous qualities. Well, conservatism, you know, it's kind of like considered you're scared of crime just because you're poor or you're you're cowardly. Um, you know, you're you don't want immigration because you're racist because you're you know because you tend to associate prejudice with stupidity, which there is a fair amount of truth in it. Um, so, so over time, an institution will become more and more openly until eventually it gets to the point where most institutions in Britain, you know, charities just become openly progressive, and that that's their set of mm. values. Um, there is a sort of a certain amount of, um, you know, employment discrimination, and I sort of touch on the fact that people, of course, people, you know, it comes to an amount of the right fit. Uh, if you want someone, who, you know, you want to work with someone you totally disagree with, and so conservatives tend to be sort of pushed out of these institutions, not in a kind of aggressively hostile way, but it just becomes somewhere where, if you're a conservative and people just talk, I mean, I've been in an office where people just openly. Talk about politics in the assumption that everyone is a sort of centre left mm. um, supporter because it, you know, and I just wouldn't stand up saying, oh, actually, I think they, you know, got a few people got a point about that. It's just, you know, you don't want to be the hate person. So I think, um, you know, in, in academia, it's much more um, extreme because I think some of the some of the subjects which have become really quite established since the seventies are, you know, are by definition progressive. You know, the critical theories. Um, this world because they, they start with a premise which is progressive so i mean they can't help but become progressively dominated in the same way that uh, you know a madras would, would is going to be sort of islamic or mm. uh, uh, on the or you know any kind of religious institution will lean towards that religion because that's that is basically the worldview um they espouse i mean in other professions i just think it's a general trend of the middle educated middle class away from uh, conservatism. I mean, one of the interesting things is that the study shows that there have been a couple of studies showing that people actually don't identify as conservative when they get into their 30s or 40s, even though they are actually in every way conservative. Their lifestyle is very conservative. Um, but it's just the branding. I, I know people who like that. You know, they have 
they have traditional weddings pretty much. Uh, they might not go to church, but they have a pretty, you know, the man goes out to work more than the woman. They have a very, they have very like, um, you know, high bourgeois values. Um, and, you know, they have, they go to countries, countryside retreats and the Cotswolds and stuff. And they live exactly a conservative lifestyle. I mean, they don't go hunting, for example, because, you know, Britain's quite urban, but they would be horrified at the idea there might be an actual Tory. Uh, and they and they tend to have quite centre right economic views, but you know I don't really uh, talk about economics much in the book because I suppose it's more about the social cultural war. Um, yeah, but it's just become you know very unfashionable ideology, isn't it? So. Yeah, I wonder if the the era of of sort of widespread wokeness that we are um, undergoing, right? The idea that all these institutions have turned, uh, you know, woke progressive. I wonder if the casualty of that isn't so much conservatism, but out outward or, or public conservatism. And my question to you is is, is about the, the phenomenon of the shy Tory or the shy conservative voter. And one of the reasons why a lot of polls that there's not a lot of uh, a kind of a truth that, that, that they can, and I believe we already saw that to some extent with Donald Trump's victory in 2016, was the, the idea that, that um, public spaces tend to marginalize conservative views, whether in general society, because of that, people... Um, aren't really abandoning their conservative views, those that are conservative, but just hiding them or, or muting them. My question to you is, is that, is that really kind of the future? Is the, the, the future one where, you know, conservatives keep winning on, on the basis of that sort of, you know, silent majority of people that don't embrace wokeness, don't embrace, you know, critical theory, gender theory, and all of those woke shibboleths, but people who, by the same kind of uh, mechanisms that you describing your book, the idea that live general tends to make you conservative, they, they're, they're still going through that journey. They're, they're just not doing it openly. Yeah, I mean, there may be. I mean, I tend to think that if people don't express uh, opinions uh, and they do go underground, they will, slight, they will, you know, wither on the vine because people aren't making these arguments openly. Uh, those groups will, I mean, there is, you know, I mean, everyone knows there is, there is loads of loads of conservative debate out there on social media. There is loads and loads of conservative joking and comedy and conservative discussion and, and open debate, but it's all done in direct messaging groups. You know, no one does it in public. Um, and that's where the, that's where the real, you know, I don't want to sort of uh, make too many parallels with sort of totalitarian systems, you know, in the, in the part, you know, <laughs> conservatives aren't sort of burned to the stake mm. or sent to gulags or anything, but you know, if there is, those things are a continuum, right? If there are penalties, especially if people feel that they can't um, keep their jobs if they express opinions, and there is a fair, you know, lots of people, of the BLM thing, uh, you know, within a few days, seven or eight people were sacked um, from different jobs in Britain for expressing scepticism about BLM. Now, to me, BLM is obviously a very extreme, hostile organisation. Uh, I don't think it's anywhere... It shouldn't be celebrated. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be celebrated by footballers, and it shouldn't be a sort of normalised part of life. To me, that's an extreme group with some very violent supporters that has a pretty unpleasant agenda. Loads of people made very, very mild comments about it, and they're sacked. So, I mean, around that time, that was the only time I got. I got about half a dozen messages from various people I know or people I don't know saying, "Listen, you know, I literally cannot say anything publicly about this." Um, you know, I don't know, maybe that maybe that felt like a bit of a wake-up call, because I think that, that repulsed a lot of people, the excesses, you know, the smashing down mm. statues, um, the obvious menace, the menace of it, and the fact that uh, what's more depressing is that all the, all the authorities just completely caved into these kind of organisations. You know, all, every time we see the British police on, on TV, on Twitter or whatever, they're running away. I mean, why are you guys running away? Like, you don't need to, you can stand up to these people, and... Uh, people in positions of power, politicians, they don't have to put up with this. They can get, they can, you know, they can cut off the funding to these organisations. They can tell the police to enforce the law when it needs to be, and they can say, no, we're not going to, you know, join in this whole trade. Um, but mm. people, I don't know, feel demoralised or, um, I don't know, just they just feel like there's there's nothing they can do to this kind of tide, this, this kind of yeah, this this woke tide which seems to be, which you know, in twenty twenty just has reached this complete. Um, and, and, and the irony for the police story is that while well, they're running away, they're being called fascist by the by the mob. It's a pretty it's a pretty strange situation. Yeah, um, do you think we could see a kind of larger "I am Spartacus" moment, where people saying, "You know what? Most of us don't agree with this. Why don't we stand firm on our position 
and see what happens. You know, they can't they can't take us all down, and maybe that could change. Uh, do you think we could see that one day? I think it depends on you know you need. I mean, the weird thing is with you know the cancer culture does exist, right? But I mean, people are immune. If you're rich enough, you're you're immune to it. I mean, it's like uh, I suppose it's the same with all things. So, for example, on the transgender thing, which to me is just sort of seems like a sort of strange. You know, in the middle of the culture war, it's some strange theatre in the middle of the Pacific, which I don't know why, <laughs> what's going on. Um, because it's two groups I don't really particularly, you know, side with. I think one side is far worse than the other. Um, you know, take around and say, no, nope, I don't care. I'm, this is all rubbish. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm, she's got a billion pounds. She can do it. But uh, most people are not in that position. So you just have a few journalists ranting on. But also the fact is most conservatives aren't, in in academia or the intellectual circles aren't really listened to that much and not really that important um so i mean with the wokeness thing it needs an, a, some sort of alliance between you know liberals and conservatives you know because lots of liberals hate the whole wokeness thing it's obviously, it's obviously that's very anti-liberal and it's obviously threatens them much more because their entire uh you know their entire worldview is you know you want to you leave your leave your guns in you know at home, when you take them to the political theatre, you don't bring you don't bring identity politics into everything because it's just going to explode and make everything about uh, who you are and you know either what colour you are, what religion or whatever. Um, so they're they're sort of hostile to anti to identity politics. But you know, conservatives and liberals have so many different, um, you know, so many different opinions on this um, that it's kind of hard to, you know, you know, I would say conservatives. Well, I'm not anti identity politics. You know, like. The political party I support has the Union Jack on its logo. We believe in identity. I just think when you have multiculturalism and when you have decided that all cultures must be equal in a multicultural system, that's when you're going to have problems. Um, I just want my culture to be supreme and everyone to sort of accept <laughs> that. So it would be dishonest of me to, uh, to say, you know, to, to join the liberals in opposing identity politics. I mean, we just have so many differences of opinion. We all sort of oppose the, the sort of woke. The, the sort of totalitarian, totalitarian mindset. But I suppose liberals would think, well, their kind of heart's in the right place, isn't it? They basically sort of want... Um, well, I would think, no, their heart's not in the right place. They're just extremists. Um, I don't think we should have anything to do with them. But I don't know. I mean, there is definitely pushback. because the, the whole world thing is obviously quite repulsive. To Most Americans in surveys don't like it. Most British people don't like it. It has... It's universally unpopular. I think it's pretty much unpopular amongst all minorities. So you can see it's just really about white narcissism, basically, for a lot of people who just want to proclaim how, you know, they all want to be Daenerys from Game of Thrones on this massive thing. Like, a crowd of brown people say, oh, you're the best. You're just so amazing, whitey. Um, and that's what's driving it. We, we all know it's kind of upper class phenomenon with a few sort of drifters from um, minority backgrounds, you know, most of them from very wealthy upper class minority backgrounds. Who are mm -hmm. along for the ride. Uh, I mean, it's very unpopular, but it doesn't seem to, I mean, sometimes it gets to a certain stage, a ridiculous stage, and there's a tiny bit of pushback, but they basically, they've gained all that ground still. I mean, okay, they've lost a tiny bit at the end, but, you know, without using any crude, warm metaphors, you know, they've gone, you know, they've taken, like, hundreds of kilometres of of territory from the opponent, and they've had to yeah, exactly. give up a few dozen at the end. So, the, you know, the, they still progress through and i think the world will be more woke in five years time than it is now even if the excesses of 2020 are sort of un, you know, unpopular yeah and it's uh you know it's it's really interesting you kind of um you, you kind of envision here how you know this this whole tide could eventually turn and I, I i would i would concur with you i think 2020 has definitely been kind of a fever pitch and it, it would be really hard to imagine this sort of like heightened state of feverish wokeness to sort of like durably uh, be durably maintained, right? It's it's really hard. Uh, it, 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 people stay angry all that time. I mean, lockdown obviously hasn't helped because there's a lot of people just at home with nothing to do, and yeah. all they're doing is spending time on the internet, get angry. Yeah, it's, it's disastrous. Yeah, uh, I'm not anti-lockdown. I'm just saying that's it's an inevitable consequence of that. Um, yeah. but, you know, there is a why. It is a wider problem. Um, you know, in terms of like, how do we reverse it? I think the the huge oversupply of university places is definitely a huge factor in this push left. Uh, and it's making young people much more radically left wing, but it's also making them obviously much unhappier. Yeah. Um, this, you know, oversupply of university. We have in, in Britain, Tony Blair, this idea, you know, 50% of the people you go to university, it's like, that's insane. <laughs> like, why would you send someone who's at the very middle 
in terms of you know aptitude and, and intelligence to go to something which is really only very useful for a quite small number of people relatively. Mm. Uh, and so they've increased all these things, um, uh, and they've increased a lot of these very very political subjects. Uh, you know, at the same time, this week the SOAS, you know, it's one of the most respected institutions in British academia. They've cancelled loads of um, Middle Eastern languages, you know, ancient Middle Eastern languages. They used to teach like Akkadian and Hittite. And, you know, I'm an old fogey, but I think people should learn that kind of stuff, right? That's really interesting. That's useful. Learning like queer theory is just it's just garbage. I mean. It's literally rubbish. I mean, there's no need to learn it. We should be, you know, they should be teaching much, much rather kids learned about Arcad- Arcadian and, you know, ancient Assyrian and stuff. Yeah. Um, but we've just got too many university places. And I think that is definitely um, in the States, especially with the cost, the absolutely incredible cost of these tuitions. But everyone needs them because everyone else has one as well. So, yeah. And it- uh, that is one of the overwhelming driving forces, just the. This, you know, which is basically uh, prolonging adolescence for so many people, partly just because they can't afford to ever have children. If they, yeah. if, if you've got a hundred grand of debt and you're, you know, I saw something. There's a Guardian piece, you know, before the election I'm reading, uh, and they interviewed a little Kent and they interviewed this woman and said, "Oh, I've got this degree and now I can't get a job and blah blah." blah. And I, I just googled her because I thought hmm, oh, that's a bit strange. Can't get any job. Uh, and job market's pretty good. Uh, and her study was in something like queering her, because she did a PhD, a master's degree, and her, her dissertation was in like queering Star Trek, you know, the queer theory of Star Trek. Like, mm-hmm. What? No, you're not going to get a job from that. So that, might be, <laughs> that might be a fun thing to do if you want to pay for it in your own time, but that, it's insane that, that you're sort of yeah. encouraging people to do that. And then so people come out poorer, but obviously completely um, indoctrinated into a set of ideas. And, you know, is it any wonder that? These ideas spread throughout the country, yeah. and it's it's a really it's um it's a really interesting avenue to, to some some author in the states and uh, I'm zoning out on his name right now, but uh, has um, kind of defined what you just described as elite overproduction. Right, yeah, I wonder. Peter Turchin, yeah. Oh, who's that again? Peter Turchin. He's a uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and a lot yeah. of people in the he's in Connecticut. He's uh, yeah, he's really interesting. He's the guy who said 2020 would end up in like huge amounts of violence. Oh, really? He wrote a book 10 years ago. Well, no, it was 10 years ago. It was like eight years ago saying, oh, you know, there's cycles in the... I mean, I don't know about his theory because it seems like a mathematical model of history, which I'm sceptical of, but it's very interesting. And he said, well, you know, we're due a big, like, crisis around 2020. So yeah. there we go. Yeah. The coronavirus comes along and he's completely right. That's that's some Nostradamus uh, stuff. Right yeah, that is right. I, yeah. Burned yeah. Them, but, uh, really appreciate you kind of bringing up credentialism and, and, and the fact that, you know, universities become so democratized and how that can... Uh, be a, a kind of a hidden factor in, in the in the wokeness that we're living in. People, for instance, in the States, when you mention or elite overproduction, they will instantly think of, it's almost like instantly brings to mind um, Alex, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or, you know, as, as that sort of like stylized, um, kind of like, uh, you know, a 20-something year old who's, uh, you know, got, he's, you know, he or she has all the credentials, but she's uh, most um, likely a, a victim of the, the 08 crash, uh, but that that an experience of uh, labor precar- precarity, right, or, or underemployment can, can really radicalize people. And when you've got too many people with university degrees yeah. and not enough um, university uh, u- university, ed- you know, and the job market just doesn't doesn't uh, adhere to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is one. Yeah, I mean, like only a, a frac- only a, a kind of fraction of uh, jobs where people go from university actually require the degree. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, and you know that combined with the housing market, yeah. So there's a certain genre of person you see them with. They've got the pronouns in a Twitter biography. They'll have a red rose in in this mm-hmm. country. Uh, you know, so certain signs just say, okay, you can never afford to have a family. That's really sad. Uh, and obviously, you're going to become radicalized if that's a, if that's a consequence. Yeah. But I wonder uh, if, if um, you know, and, and you were, because I, I want to harken back to something you were describing earlier, and it's, it's kind of striking here. Uh, you were kind of envisioning the different kind of possibilities that this tide of wokeness could turn. Uh, obviously, one of the issues that people kind of think when they, when they see the UK is that your in- the institutions that have been captured by wokeness, primarily the BBC, were so revered. 
were just such a staple of Britishness and of British identity and your kind of your your sense of self that um, it, it's it's and, and now you know and, and now it's really hard within the, your your broadcasting network to, to counter that. So it's it, it's really tragic. Um, the, the 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 point it's gotten. But, but my question to you was if if we are to see that you were speaking earlier about you know this possible alliance between kind of like old school liberals who still believe in freedom of speech and don't want to buy into the sort of like racialized or ethnicized or gender genderized or whatever you call it kind of view mm-hmm. of human nature it, th- those people right in the likes of like Steven Pinker has been a, a paragon of this in the states JK Rowling right if they ally with us then that's that's like a front that's a coalition you can build against the tide of wokeness but i i wonder if if you if, if have you seen that i mean are, are it seems to me like whenever that happens it's very quickly followed by a counterattack by the by the work movement like we saw jk jk rowling for instance the the stand she took against uh you know transgender sort of like ideology we also saw the harper's letter that famous like liberal magazine that published a letter for freedom of speech and and shortly after they they, they even something happened they, they had her retracted um right it's it's like whenever whenever those um moments of like mm-hmm. liberal principled um uh this is enough moment Whenever that kind of moment happens, very quickly, it's just overrun by by the next wave of, of wokeness. So it, it it doesn't seem to me like it sticks, like it lasts. So is that is that even possible that we can see liberals, old school liberals, really taking a stand? Uh, I mean, that, I think the telling thing about the Harper's letter was the age, average ages and signatories versus the average age of people opposed it. Um, you know, oh, yeah, 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 right. in, in the British media, especially based at BBC, but even uh, in left-wing newspapers and magazines, mm-hmm. there are lots of very principled liberals who, you know, who think, well, everyone should have a, uh, pla- you know, everyone should have a say in the conversation should include everyone, and and um, you know, we shouldn't s- censoring uh, stories which don't fit our narrative. And um, but they tend to be, they tend to be at the older ones. Um, there is no sign of that mm. principle amongst younger. Uh, mm. like younger journalists. I mean, it does. I find. I mean, <laughs> journal, the younger journalists on the left now tend to be activists. I mean, I'm probably you know I'm guilty of this myself. But the comment and the report. I mean, I'm never a reporter mm-hmm. as such, but the kind of line between reporting and commentary is definitely kind of completely dissolved. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, people do. And we see it in the way that I mean, certain. How do I say it delicately? Certain issues in Britain now, the way reporting is done now is just completely different to what it was 10, 15 years ago. And it's really mm. not even talked about. So it's certain issues just avoided. Um, mm. Certain, you know, what is the BLM thing, which is just uh, nowhere will you see in any, even like a centre-right paper, they will never, ever discuss the overwhelming issue, which is which is not, you know, how many people from different races are shot, but what is the crime rate? I mean, that is the basic, like, that is, if you're just trying to discuss a problem, it's like, okay, that might be uncomfortable, but mm-hmm. that is kind of central to the issue. Mm. The BBC, uh, they had a thing, you know, they have a regular thing where they compare, uh, you know, imprisonment rates and shooting rates, and they compare in, um, in the States. They say white, Hispanic, and black. It's like, okay, but there are four or sometimes five racial groups in, in America, and all the crime stats compare them all. So why have you left out Asian Americans? It's just weird, but you're obviously trying to get an angle. Um, and, and that is partly because the younger people, and you can tell, like, a BBC website, some of the stuff is just done by younger people because it's just real, like, classic that generation, you know, fat shaming, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm gender queer, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. And mm-hmm. it's just like, yeah, it's, you know, the, for example, articles on pornography, which there is no ever even question that pornography has any kind of moral, like, uh, issue towards it. It's just, oh, pornography is just, you know, a thing you do. Um, yeah, so the, the younger generation are clearly, they're, they're activists, basically, and they see the media as a, as an idea activism. And one of the reasons why, you know, the BBC is a mixed feelings towards it, because I think it's great in many ways. Uh, but one reason I very, very uh, wary the idea of, you know, people abolishing it because they think it's centre left is I just think it'll be replaced by something with CNN, which is just going to be much worse. And <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. it's not like world yeah. capitalism, you see world capitalism everywhere. Like the worst pushers of this crap are big companies because they don't care because they're just, they want yeah. to flat, flatter their audience, right? So, you know, an independent um, sort of version of the BBC, which is, there will still just be a woke BBC paid for by subscription or paid for by advertising, advertising mm. much, much worse. 
It'll be worse. Because yeah. I have no editorial control. These people, people on the BBC, some people still believe in this idea that there is an impartial news and we should try to give both sides. Okay, most journalists tend to be centre left, and so they, they, you know, they're and they're a metropolitan-based media organisation. You can't help but be slightly centre left, but they do try. Uh, I just dread what the the future. I mean, we're at the moment there is the possibility of the Fox News expanding to the UK, which I'm very, I have mixed feelings about. I mean, because I just think it's gonna we're gonna end up like America even more. It's gonna be awful. We're gonna have Fox versus CNN. It's just gonna be, mm. it's just gonna be hell, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think it ties in well with um, the conversation about we're having right now about a growing tendency within the broader conservative movement in the UK, in the US, and much of it mainly in Europe. Just to question the decades-old alliance between uh, the free market centre and the more culturally conservative right. Um, I mean, we can go back to Christopher Lash, who made this case very powerfully in the revolt of the elites. But essentially, this new movement accuses the centre-right leadership of not realising that a totally deregulated economy ends up breaking over traditional structures conservative should hold dear, such as a family, such as a local community, such as a nation. Oh, I mean, I mean, Christopher Lash to me is the he is the prophet. I mean, he is the the Revolt of the Elites is uh, the most incredibly prophetic book. I mean, I read it first like, 10 years ago. I thought, wow, he wrote this in 93. Um, and, and, you know, the world he was describing wasn't hadn't moved that far, but it really describes, you know, the second day, decade of the 21st century in such accuracy, and it's just come to a head. I mean, so for a certain area of the, the right, uh, you know, Lash is just, he's everything. And, you know, there is, there is a movement. But we, we, the thing is, you know, unheard. We're very much in that sort of bracket. We tend to be more, um, you know, we're not. I wouldn't say the top left part of the uh, political compass, but we're much more skeptical of the free market um, than previous conservatives. And you know, our side is definitely growing. And I think in the states there is, you know, Tucker is definitely on board. You know, he he says, you know, the yeah, Josh, mm, of course, he's, yeah. Um, so, you know, he says that, you know, Tucker says the greatest re- threat to your freedom is not from the government, it's from big companies. I think that is absolutely right. They, you know, there's big companies, they will, you know, they will crush you if they want to. If it may, <laughs> I mean, they might do it for money and they might do it for genuine ideology, but there's nothing to stop them. And the, the free market is not going to, it's not going to save you. And when you think about sort of Thatcher and Reagan, mm. I think they're, you know, it's arguable they were dealing with, the problem with time and the on and the right at the time, um, and that's what maybe the economy or society needed. I don't know, but um, you know that is definitely not the cons- conservatism I would sign up to. I, I'm, I undoubtedly, I, you know, without question, I think the free market um, has uh, a very detrimental effect on a lot of things we love. And if it was left uh, uncontrolled, you know, we would we would really suffer. I mean, it's, it's definitely not conservative. I mean, if you look at all the social issues uh, that conservatives face. I mean, I think the you know big business is the biggest obstacle to a lot of them. Uh, and mm. yeah, I think the conservative movement generally is moving towards that direction. As inevitably, you know, with the grit realignment, the sort of centre left is becoming more. I mean, I I didn't like using this word because. I, Lots of people use it. I'm not sure everyone knows what it means, but neoliberal in the sense of being, uh, you know, believing the freedom market was slightly regulated <laughs> and believing the social liberalism, but also that the government should also push social liberalism because that's also good for the free market and the two things go um, sort of hand in hand. You know, and Maggie Thatcher did so much to create mm. that because she, so, you know, she put money in people's pockets for spending and for, and, and, you know, she kind of really helped create this, I don't know if it's much to blame her, but yeah, certainly it's played a part in this individualistic um, mindset. Yeah, so the, you know, the mm. argument goes from you know, Thatcher to Blair, the, the argument on the sort of the immigration front, you know, you want restrictionists versus people which want free movement. Um, obviously, I'm a restrictionist, there's no doubt about that. And the free movement side are, you know, they are the children of Thatcher, that is their argument. I mean, some of them have to do it for compassionate or utopian socialist reasons, but they're kind of less, they're less influential um, than the sort of hard-nosed Thatcherites who just think, oh, it's my right to move from place to place. It's best for the market. Increases GDP by 0.1% this year. So uh, I think, well, what about like the future? What about posterity? What about your grandchildren? What about the right to having a, an affordable home? And your society you know, has been changed beyond all 
recognition um, for 0.1% of GDP. That to me is like, so they, but you know, they are the heirs of Thatcher in that sense. But that I'm, you know, I'm definitely in the, the, an heir to, to Lash, who uh, I think is right. Yeah. And, and I'll just, I'll just kind of picky, piggyback off of that to ask you, you know, it's really interesting how you're right. describing this sort of inner tension within the right. I think it's something we've certainly seen, seen after uh, the electoral upset in, in America with, with Trump, this sort of like realignment towards more of a middle class focus, sort of like worker focus, economic agenda that embraces, um, you know, maybe, maybe an industrial policy, maybe some level of tariffs, certainly immigration restrictionism. And I want to mention uh, to this effect that uh, Ed's last book before uh, Small Men on the Wrong Side of History was a fantastic book also about immigration that we also encourage people to go go head over to Amazon and buy. It was called The Diversity Illusion, What We Got Wrong About Immigration, How to Set It Right. But um, aside from that, yeah. uh, you know, it's really interesting how you, you seem to be describing a similar process um, going on in the UK. Obviously, Johnston uh, managed to, you know, put together a coalition that relied more heavily on the North right? Uh, breaking the red wall of these old, old time labor constituencies. We've seen, I remember Nick Timothy's book was also a great, great argument in this direction. Yeah, but yeah. do you, yeah, you know, the great old. question right now in America, as we head into November is, is this realignment going to stick, right? I mean, Trump is perhaps not the best messenger of this realignment, but he has effectively practiced it, right? He's, he's, he, you know. and, and so the question now is whether, say he loses, imagine he loses in November, um, what's what's going to be of that of that realignment? Are the Hollies and the and the Tom Cottons and the um, uh, you know, Marco Rubios of the world going to take over towards a more worker class working class oriented GOP, or are the neoliberals going to going to return? Um, how do you see that in the UK? What do you what do you? I mean, obviously, say Boris uh, loses the, ne the next election, and how do you think the right is the right going to rediscover neoliberalism? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean. It's hard to, I mean, for outside observers, it's hard to really emphasize the 2019, the, the, the seats that the, the Tories won from Labour, if you had predicted that 20 years ago, it would have been completely astonishing. These are some of the most um, working class, ex-industrial seats. These, like, there are about a dozen of them which voted like two thirds or three quarters for Labour in 97, and where the Tories are barely in single fingers. And these are areas where a lot of Tories are really hated. You know, they're the people who close down mines, they're the you know, they're the party of Thatcher and they've always been, they're the party of the rich, while the late, these are generations of voters of Labour, but, uh, you know, we are on the stage where social class has been completely upended as a, as the, as the barrier in British politics. And in America, it's, you know, identity to, and I suspect increasingly in the future, it will be a certain amount of race involvement as well. I mean, if you look at the 1945 election when Labour won the massive, um, that was a great victory, three quarters of working class British people voted Labour, and I think it was two thirds of um, middle class people, or maybe three quarters. There's a lot, a big majority of the middle class voted conservative. Now that was Britain at, the, at its very highest sort of level, social capital. It's the most, it's the most social solidarity it's ever had. That you know, just endure the war. It become very egalitarian, uh, and so people just voted on basically how much of the pie we share out, and how much of the pie we keep, whatever. So that was the basic argument. There wasn't yeah, really the agenda. If you look at the values of the parties at the time, they would have been very, very closely aligned. The Labour Party, you know, was very anti-communist. Um, and, you know, there was very little. And so that, that starts changing in the 60s when the classes started moving a bit with this permissive society. I mean, the same thing happened in most Western countries. So the sort of socialist party starts becoming more liberal in that reason. So more working class voters start moving to the right and more middle class liberals start moving towards the left. But since 2019, that completely changed it. Now, on every poll um, going, the Conservatives have working class majority and Labour have a middle class, have most of their support from the middle class. So, I mean, even if the Tories lose some of these seats, mm. which I think they may well do, because <laughs> they haven't handled this crisis very well, we're about to go into recession, and Keir Starmer is a much better politician than Jeremy Corbyn, and that's a very low bar. But um, I mean, Keir Starmer's, you know, today he's talking about a lot of the kind of more socially conservative sort of stuff. You know, it's not quite family, flag and faith, but it's almost there. And, you know... It's kind of BS, but he's triangulating at least. He understands the Blair thing. You've got to triang triangulate and sound a bit more like the opposition than they are. So I think there's a good chance the Tories will lose a lot of these seats and they'll lose um, the next election. But, you know, it's a long way away. But those still those seats are still going to be lower hanging fruit than than any sort of uh, more liberal middle class seats. Uh, so, I, you know, I just think political parties go for where they can get the votes. Um, and the Tory votes are going to be uh, probably in the same 
places where the Republican votes are. They're going to be uh, smaller towns. You know, density and education levels and percentage of you know white Britain are probably going to be the biggest indicators of who votes Conservative in the future. There's no point in the Conservatives trying to win Londoners over, for example. You know, where I, I live, there's a 40,000 majority in, in a borough in our constituency for Labour now. And it's just the Conservatives get like 9%. I mean, I'm probably like one of three conservatives in my area. <laughs> uh, it's just a dead end for them. Then there's no point in appealing to people who are never going to vote for you. So they're going to go for the low-hanging fruit. And so inevitably, uh, right-wing parties in both Britain and America and elsewhere are going to go, you know, going to emphasise kind of cultural issues. You know, they're going to present themselves as, you know, the, the party that's pro-British. You know, they're going to wrap themselves in the flag. And there's nothing anyone can do about that. It's just the way that politics works and a kind of diverse, and I mean diverse more than just ethnically diverse, just more diverse values, uh, which, you know, modern societies have. And Labour are, you know, going to really be the opposite of that. That's, I think that's the way that, so, you know, I think generally a lot of these more working class constituencies will probably stay Tory and the Tory party will have to become more, you know, into redistribution, even if they're against that, you know, uh, you know, especially since this crisis, Began, there's been, you know, they've they've much more, you know, emphasised their support for the NHS. I mean, I find this really bizarre because I think, you know, we've got like the 23rd best healthcare system in Europe or something, whatever it is. And since, since coronavirus, which our health authorities have been absolutely useless in dealing with, it's become even, you know, the cult has grown even, even stronger. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's never going to be a reform of that because the NHS, for obvious historical reasons, is really important um, to the British working class because all of a sudden, you know, they someone will look after them, they're sick, and they didn't really have that before, but I mean, the fact that Germany and France and pretty much most other Western European countries have different healthcare systems that are much better than ours, you know, that's just, that's impossible to get past the British psyche anymore, it's just, we'll be on that. Um, but, you know, they are going to be much, they're going to have to start spending more on, um, on, you know, on redistribution, that's going to be what the Conservative Party that's is now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know where the Labour Party goes, if the Labour Party is like a Blairite party or if it's more a radical socialist party. It will have to be a sort of un uncomfortable combination of the two in various ways, the two sides struggling for power. So speaking of, of realignment, um, your book is about conservatism, but don't you think there's also a case for saying that kind of conservative, progressive div divide is less important now than it used to be before? And that what has been more important is open, closed, globalist, patriot, somewhere, anywhere, you can call it what you want. Don't, don't you think that kind of matters most? Rather than people, you know, having kind of, oh, sort of having conservative instincts saying, well, you know, Jeremy Corbyn can't even sing the national anthem right and can't, can't say the IRA or Hezbollah are, are enemies of, of England. Um, don't you think that matters more than kind of um, conservatism and progressivism and you know, maybe, maybe we're just hammering about wokeism but maybe maybe people don't care as much as you know oh I've, I'm, I'm, I'm British and I feel that Labour um, is selling me an internationalist dream I, I, I don't I don't feel I belong to. Yeah yeah I mean I, I, that's fair enough but I would still say that is sort of the left-right divide I mean it's almost like an older divide I mean, one of the curious things is that we are much more returning to the pre-industrial divide in England it was the Whigs versus the Tories the Whigs were the who wanted free trade and open markets and tended to be more tolerant about religions while the Tories were countryside, you know, tradition, king and country, the Church of England. Uh, and we're sort of returning to that, really, with you know, the Whigs, the sort of globalists and the neoliberals, whatever you want to call them, and, you know, the Tories are now the, the Tories again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really like the open, the closed uh definition or just the title because it you know closed obviously has pejorative terms no one wants to be closed-minded by definition um i mean there was a a good thing i mean one the, the piece i'm writing on right now is a uh, there was an article in the Eco economist about uh basically about this closed open thing and the, the person recommended an example of an open society the mongol empire <laughs> which i thought <laughs> oh, they literally left baghdad as like a pyramid of skulls and like burned down the entire library. And I think it, they killed about 10% of the world population or something. Um, but in the way, the kind of global-minded, you know, the economist FT reading sets, uh, you know, the elites that, that are involved, they are sort of returning to a, an imperial a model of globalisation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they want free movement, they want the free movement of ideas, 
Um, a nomadic empire. And, you know, and they, that is a return to the norm of old, of the great empires of old, of Rome, of, uh, you know, Alexandria, of Constantinople, you know, before Ataturk, and all these great empires, uh, you know, were very diverse and open-minded, and there was a bit of um, cultural fusion. I mean, they just weren't democracies. That's the thing. You can't have the two. And, and they had... They didn't have what you know Americans call Republican virtue. They things were done in a way that very much suited the elites. And I guess that's the kind of that's the sort of end point for me for the open uh the open minded worldviews. You're not gonna really have um strong democracies with that sort of strong sense of social solidarity that they depend on. Yeah, because uh, there's a fascinating tension which was um put forward in Yasha Munch's um book. Um and essentially Yasha Munch says right. Well, we've got a growing tension between people who are liberals, but maybe not so much Democrats. And yeah. on the right, especially, we're seeing people who are Democrats who will give massive plebiscites to Viktor Orban or, or the Law and Justice Party in Poland, but who are not so comfortable with the kind of liberal aspect of liberal democracy. And I think, I think that's an interesting tension. In many ways, what we're seeing is a kind of, you're talking about empires. Well, what was interesting in the, in the whole Brexit story in, in the UK is I was a feeling that the kind of Lib Dem, centre-left uh, Remain, Remainers felt probably a lot closer to the equivalents in Paris and Brussels than they did with their fellow um, countrymen a few miles north or south, depending on where you live in. I mean, they're, they're, they're fellow countrymen next door. And um, that makes kind of perfect sense. I mean, especially since the, the international elite now pretty much all speak English, for, for good or ill. <laughs> and, um, I mean, if you are a, a sort of, a, you read The Economist and you're a, a London liberal, you do have more in common with someone who, who lives in Munich and reads The Economist. Uh, than you do with your neighbour next door. I mean, that's perfectly reasonable that you should. Uh, and I thought the the Brexit thing, you know, whether it was good or bad. I mean, I think the imperial. I mean, the, there was this New York Times um, repeated memes. Oh, the British are fond for their, um, you know, their empire. They want to bring back the empire. That's what it's all about. But I, mean, I just thought it was it was the complete opposite of um, of um, of the truth. You know, it was. The Remainers heart much more back to this international body, this over, you know, it was more or sort of, you know, the, the kind of spirit of Charlemagne lives within yeah. the EU. I mean, they, they quite openly say it. And, you know, the French president has, <laughs> I think he has a bit of that in him, which is kind of, you know, quite admirable in many ways. While I thought that the majority view of the, the Brexit, especially amongst the some more socially conservative leaders, was more of a sort of little England kind of thing. I mean, people, people express pride in their empire. And people misunderstand that. They just mean, Everyone wants to be number one, right? Everyone wants to be top dog. So, you know, if you ask the most uh, similar poll of young, you know, second generation Pakistanis, are you proud of the Mughal Empire? I say, of course. When the Muslims ruled India, of course, like, we were proud of that. Because everyone wants to be number one. I don't think it's a sort of general rule to want to impose your will on the rest of the world and have the, the rest of the world, you know, tied up in this, in this Raj. I, I think, if anything, it was more of sort of retreat for most people to wants to go and sort of live in the Shire and live like hobbits and away yeah. from the like, tide of globalisation. But, you know, that was also in conflict with, you know, amongst the, the leaders of the Leave thing, which, you know, Boris Johnson was among them, there were the sort of the more Whiggish ones. And they, you know, they always use this pi like pirate language for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> all the buccaneers, like, what are you going to do? You're going to like attack Spanish ships? Or then, <laughs> they just live in this kind of this Drake fantasy that, you know, yeah. Britain has this energy again to take on the whole world. It's kind of, you know, it's the, 19th century gospel of free trade all over again was a this liberal idea. And I think, I mean, that is one of the reasons I became kind of disillusioned with the whole thing. Because I thought, you know, these two, these two ideas are completely in tension with each other. I mean, all, all philosophies have tensions, right? But it, these, these two groups want, want literally opposite, uh, opposing ideas. And, and they're breaking apart in, in parliament pretty much, pretty obviously. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, since... Progressively. Yeah, they, I mean, the, I don't know. I mean, obviously now, you know, the, the COVID has completely pushed everything aside temporarily and they're still trying to get through this uh, agreement. But yeah, I mean, what, like, what view of Britain do you want? Do you want to, I mean, you know, the, the sort of, I was calling them the Whig Brexiteers. They want to, they want these free, free trade deals with India and China and, you know, they want to get on the high seas again. And, you know, but these free trade deals with China, that's going to speed up globalisation in London. Mm. You're going to see more big towers in London. Um, we're gonna. It would mean more migration from um, these countries, which is not what people, you know, voted for. And uh, when actually, you know, my thought was actually maybe staying in the EU would, would be the slower version of 
like globalization, which maybe is like the safer option, especially now the world's like looking much more dangerous. But uh, I don't know. I guess that ship has sailed, so to speak. Yeah, that's interesting. So I agree. I think that's a fundamental tension between the Brexit side, between the the pirates and the and the um, and the farmers, essentially, who want to stay on each of their side. But to to keep on on Brexit, what I think is interesting about Brexit is. You talk about conservatives never actually having proper victory, but just kind of delaying the whole process. But Brexit is maybe not a victory for the conservatives, but at least it's a setback to the liberal progressive agenda. And um, and whatever you can think of, you know, the decision to leave the EU, whether you think it's it's reasonable or not. But we've seen since 2016 among some of the Remainers what looks to be some kind of a tantrum from a kid who isn't used to share his toys, with attempts very nearly succeeding to essentially pretend like the 2016 vote never happened. Essentially, progressives are so convinced that they have winds of history blowing on their side, they can only see events like Brexit as an act of pure sabotage by mutineers. Are conservatives condemned to have to face that much anger every time they have the kind of rare cultural victory here and there? Uh, yeah, I mean, look at you know in the states when you know they, the appointment of Judge Kavanaugh, the, mm-hmm. the hysteria that that things that reads every tiny, tiny little thing, I mean, especially now you know with. We're so overwhelmed with, you know, I think it's, it's political hypochondria. You know, you get people, serious people, and these are academics. These are like, you know, highly, these people are very top of British society. You've seen them tweeting since 2016 that we're entering a sort of a pre-fascist state and we're, we're about to become a, an actual fascist country. It's just, it's just so weird. It's a kind of political hypochondria. Mm. It's like every time you see a mole, it's like, it's, this is cancer, I'm going to die. It's like, we're not, we're not the opposite of fascism, but Britain is becoming even more liberal. Like every poll since 2016, we've become much more liberal than we were before. Um, we, we are speeding ahead of the rest of Europe in becoming more liberal, and partly because, you know, England's kind of a strange place in many ways, and so we're much more influenced by America. But, you know, as with Trump, this kind of con- complete convincing themselves that, that you know, America or Britain are heading into these, you know, dangerous situation we know we had this you know Quiro uh, ad- adaptation a couple of years ago in the BBC which was about the 1930s which was clearly a really obvious parallel for Brexit it's like, oh wow mm. they're rounding up the foreigners what's going to happen you know we're going to become a fascist it's like immigration for Britain's at record levels like almost no one's left like I, that didn't happen in Nazi Germany as I remember people weren't begging to come in mm. um, I'm not saying it's, it's perfect but um, you know the way that the remain result was greeted was yeah it was a massive shock partly because no one expected brexit to win uh, i didn't expect brexit to win um and i was dude, god i couldn't believe it when i saw the sun's result um come through uh and i remember the next day there was real anger i went to a pub uh you know in my area met some friends and you know everyone just looked i mean it was the, the only comparable thing is like when england like, knocked out the world cup I suppose, <laughs> you know, the next day everyone's walking around like, oh no this is uh, but I suppose it's more important. Um, but then, the, you know, barmaid says to me, like, oh, I'm really sorry. I was like, oh, saying, well, I voted Brexit. For <laughs> the only person in the pub. But, but, you know, there obviously are others in every area, even even in the most liberal area, you know, like a quarter of people or a fifth of people would have voted for Leap. But and since then, it just became very strange. A lot of people just genuinely, you know, lose their mind. I mean, I don't name them. A couple of MPs and, and Lords uh, just sort of went into denial mode uh this kind of conviction that it's all some weird russian plot or you know algorithms trick the people uh it's just it's very weird it was the first really big setback for the social liberal movement in uh, ever really i mean you know the thatcher government was an economic policy really they didn't really uh do anything socially conservative in any way. Um, you know, the only one thing remembered is Section 28, which was a, a law against promoting same-sex couples in, in schools, and that, mm-hmm. and that sort of became glorious because it was pretty much the only thing they did. Um, but yeah, this was a really, really big setback, and people just couldn't believe that 52% of the population you know, disagreed with them. Um, so yeah, there, you know, that, and I think that was a bit of a I mean, it was a shock to Boris as well, I think. You know, Boris Johnson, there was, you know, pictures of him the next day. He, he was quite popular amongst non-Tories. You know, he's voted mayor twice in a very non-Tory city. And he's always wanted to be nice, but liked. But he realised, you know, the people, kind of his people, the middle class, really, really hated him. They were all shouting scum at him, you know. 
Um, and loads of, you know, loads of reports of people just, you know, not, they don't want to talk to friends or relatives who voted leave. And it, there was huge anger. So I think that maybe is a bit of a, a warning to people to say, if you ever tried doing anything similar, you know, the levels of anger are going to be so intense. Uh, that, you know, it will take a brave man who, who just has to be hated. I mean, I don't, I don't think the Prime Minister, one of his faults is that he genuinely wants to be loved. He wants to be, you know, the class clown. Hmm. Um, conservatives in the future is going to need people who really don't mind being hated, who, who can just, you know, admit that. I don't know what person <laughs>so ed is out it was a great chat with him so Jorge, what do you think of uh of ed and his thesis yeah i th- listen I, I thought i thought it was a really good third episode i was really glad we, we were able to get ed in and he's always been you know very nice to us and uh funnily enough just as we recorded this i woke up this morning to a tweet from ed uh, which announces that you know the new paperback edition to small men on the wrong side of history which by the way was a huge hit it was a uh, it was very popular when it came out i believe towards the end of 2019 but the mm. paperback edition that is just about to be uh published it has a title it has changed the title so the book is no longer small men on the wrong side of history it's now called tory boy which i think which i think really captures the kind of the mm. um some of the social commentary social and cultural commentary that ad rolls out throughout throughout all these um great essays in, in the book and particularly the fact that you know he describes this sort of um social penalty to being a conservative um right up to these days it, it still happens and it's something that ed really um eloquently describes he's a great writer he's obviously um you know done, done a lot of great stuff for unheard which is this up and coming very popular um opinion site yeah, and I think what's really at the heart of a lot of his analysis is is the idea that um, the kind of the prosaic um, transition throughout one's lifetime, uh, usually right, commonly around uh, your twenties or thirties, the transition of old from being a sort of an I- idealistic left leaning um, young adult towards being more of a uh, conservative or at least more of a prudent sort of um having a more prudent sort of mindset yeah from from no heart to no head <laughs> exactly in in adulthood uh and this has been variously captured obviously one of the most famous quotes uh, about this is from Winston Churchill who said you know if you're um under under 30 and you're not a socialist you don't have a heart and if you're over 30 and you're not on the right you don't have a head or something like that right i think you're yeah. uh, speaking to that with with that um dichotomy and and i think chesterton had a, had, a, had a very interesting quote um, about this as well, um, namely that, um, you know, a conservative is essentially a liberal who has gotten robbed by life mm. <laughs> or something along those lines. So I thought just in, in a nutshell, I thought this third episode was, was a great sort of very sweeping, very broad uh, overview of the cultural dynamics of the cultural, the, the sort of the dynamics of the culture war. And I was really glad that we, we were able to, to do this with Ed. What did you think? I, I thought it was really interesting, the, the focus on culture, mm. because there, there's been a, a temptation uh, on right, among right-wing parties and thinkers and, and politicians to focus only on the political and they actually tend to be quite good at winning political battles. Mm. But culturally, there's been a lot of defeats and, you know, for example, academia is more left-leaning nowadays than it's ever been. It's been, it's been ever more in, uh, left-wing over the past 50 years, um, even in media, the rest of it. And so nowadays there's, there's, there's a realization by conservatives mm. that they, they can't just simply accept to win the political battles and let the culture to, to the left. And they also need to fight on that domain as well. Mm. Now, obviously, the, the, um, the issue with that is uh, it becomes massively confrontational. Mm-hmm. Uh, Boris Johnson is trying to push his his appointees of the BBC. But if you look, for example, at the United States, where where I think 20 years ago, right-wing parties have understood the, the, the importance of, of culture. They started pushing right-wing media, right-wing mm-hmm. think tank, a lot mm-hmm. more rest of it. And uh, you couldn't say it's good for them because they're fighting the cultural battle. But it is also massively, massively confrontational all the time. I mean, Fox mm-hmm. News... Uh, has done great things for the conservative agenda, mm. but it, uh, but is also massively confrontational. Mm. Uh, and so I think I think even Ed acknowledges that tension, which is 
maybe we need a right wing media, but then he probably doesn't want a Fox News, a, a British Fox News, because of all the um, all the tensions it will create. Yeah. So I thought that was and, an interesting tension here. Yeah, and to your point, Francois, wasn't um, uh, you? You just mentioned some of the appointments that Prime Minister Johnson was able to make for the B- yeah. governing board of the BBC. Uh, you maybe even have the, the names of those people. But do you have you heard um, also about Andrew Neil's new media venture, GB? Yeah. What, what, what's, what do you know about it? I, I not that much, except that you know Andrew Neil feels that there needs to be a, mm. a proper right-wing uh, TV channel in the UK. Mm. Um, Andrew Neil is not Fox News. Um, that's something Ben Shapiro discovered um, <laughs> yeah. when he was interviewed. Um, yes. um, but, you know, it, it might be, you know, a British version of Fox News, you know, much tamer, much much mm. more British in, in, in all of that. So it's, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure what's going to end up out of it. Uh, there might be some demand. There might not be some demand. People might not even tune in because people don't watch TV as much as they used to. Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. But um, yeah, I, I think I think that's one of the things um, Ed West was alluding to with the British Fox News. I think he was probably thinking about what Andrew Neil was building together. Mm. Again, it's, it's, the United Kingdom is not America, mm. uh, but it could end up being very confrontational as well. Yeah, and you know, I, I think I think you're speaking to, to a really interesting point there. I think. Um, the idea that conservatives are good at winning electoral political battles mm. and policy wins, um, but not so good at, at kind of, um, you know, resisting the, um, the wave, the leftist wave on the culture, I think is uh, the point has been slightly overhyped in my view. I think it's been slightly overplayed to the extent that, OK, yes, um, academia, the media, um, some, some of these kind of uh, low, some of these um loci of, of high culture these um these these places have been really dominated by the left there's no question about it but as you were alluding to um fox news is a testament to the fact that there has been some resistance i mean mm-hmm. as you said i mean roger ailes's whole like vision for 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 fox was to have a channel that spoke directly to the american uh people to the he, he, there, there's certainly some political bias to, to hit. There was certainly a political bias to his view, but his idea was to build kind of like a populist um, springboard for for like a, a very kind of like middle class, middle America, like flyover country audience. And uh, that alone, I think, was was an example of how yes, there has been some effort in the culture to resist, uh, but certainly not enough. I mean, there is some truth to the fact that while the Reagan revolution was, was unfolding in the, in the eighties and America was shifting to the, to the right on, you know, economic policy and all these issues. It was, it was going quite in the opposite direction in the culture. I mean, the eighties is, is when, um, you know, obviously the, the cultural revolution was already underway from the late sixties, but a lot of stuff happened uh, then too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, but it, it's, I think there's certainly some, something to it. Um, and, and, and it's just great to see, that uh, some conservatives are now realizing and waking up to it and, and on both sides of the pond. I, I will put a finishing touch to this, which is, I agree, there's been pushback, but there's still a feeling of insurgency with his, with that pushback. Mm. It's not so, the establishment remains, you know, I tend to lean to, to, to a center-right, um, but when I end up having to pick my sources, when I want to read up about America, I end up trusting a bit more instinctively with New York Times and Fox News, mm. for example, mm. um, because there's still a kind of this insurgency aspect mm. to the right wing uh, pushback on culture, and the in the establishment institutions remain largely liberal. You know, the New York Times, the, the universities uh, remain remain in that kind of liberal mm. um, center left um, realm. So yes, there is pushback, but right now it, it remains an insurgency more than anything else. Mm. Absolutely. Well, that kind of brings it to a close, and we're we're happy that you've uh, that you've uh, you know uh, stuck with us towards the very end, and we uh, look forward to to having you back at that uh, at, a, at another episode of Uncommon Decency. Have a great week. See you next week.